I believe, to a speculative blow-off where the juniors again outperform the majors. But my suspicion is for the next 18 months, the wind is in the sails of the Kamikos and the Kazatom problems of the world. Rick Rule discusses the changing dynamics of the uranium market. He emphasizes that larger companies like Cameco and BHP Billiton are expected to outperform due to their ability to bring existing mines back into production. These companies have shifted from selling uranium in the spot market to the term market, allowing them to secure pricing for several years. This stability attracts institutional investors and ensures predictable cash flow. Rule explains that long-term contracts between producers and utilities provide security of supply and pricing, benefiting both parties. He notes a significant shift from spot market transactions to term market deals, indicating a transformed market landscape. The recent surge in uranium investments is driven by ETF buyers, retail investors, and some institutional buyers, including Japanese and Chinese entities. Rule also highlights uranium's unique position as a carbon-free energy source, making it attractive amidst concerns about carbon emissions and global energy poverty. Let's dive into the video to understand Rick's full thesis. Also, make sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and drop your comments below. You are in the part of the market now where the bigger names will outperform. Uh, they're going to outperform, particularly because Adam Prom and Cameco, for two reasons. They have large amounts of material that they can bring it back into production that's already permitted and already built. All they need to do is turn the mines on. And the structure of the market has changed. They've gone from selling the material in the spot market, where they have no price certainty, to selling the material in the term market, where they can lock in at least reference pricing for five years, seven years, sometimes 15 years. What that means is that both Cameco and Kazatomprom can return material to production where they've already built the mine and they can be assured of reasonable returns on shareholders' uh, equity for as long as they want to lock in the pricing for. First of all, the ability to know something about what your top line looks like and to manage your margin. And secondly, to be able to show the institutional investor real cash flow projections based on real contracts with credit grade counterparties very, very important. The second thing is that when the generalist money comes in the uranium space, which is just starting to happen, as you point out, they're going to go to the chemicals. They're going to go to the big names. So the big names have better fundamentals uh, in terms of the industry, and they're going to have better market perception in the near term. We will come later in the cycle, uh, I believe, to a speculative blow-off where the juniors again outperform the majors. But my suspicion is for the next 18 months, the wind is in the sails of the Kamikos and the Kazatom problems of the world. It's important to know it isn't a futures contract. There's no speculative interplay. A uh, producer, a Kamiko, goes to a utility uh, or a utility combine, China General Nuclear, and says, we agree to sell you for 15 years, a million pounds a year at a floor price of whatever the negotiated floor price is, let's say 70 US dollars a pound, with an escalator, uh, depending on the spot market or whatever index they want to use, the rate of inflation, so that both the, the utility locks in security of supply and pricing within a band, and Cameco locks in a sale and pricing within a band. If the price of uranium were to go to 150, as an example, China General Nuclear in this instance wouldn't be paying 150. They'd be paying whatever the reference price was, $75, $77. So for China General Nuclear, it locks in security of supply, which is important to them. It locks in some protection against runaway escalation uranium prices, which we saw in the last bull market. But it gives Cameco an absolutely certain return on capital employed to bring 30 million pounds of surplus production capacity back on the market. It's an extremely important development uh, in the sense that the marginal dollar with the price increase is lost. If you're Cameco uh, and you have a cash cost of production of, say, $25 a pound, what you don't want to do is sell uranium too cheaply. Yes, absolutely positively, you give up the marginal uh, price increases at the top of the scale. But locking in uh, security of price while increasing your production by 50% is very, very important. And depending on how this, the, the structure is, uh, the contract is structured, pardon me, there can be upsides built in. Uh, the higher upside is built in, the lower the floor price, of course. 
you know, it, it has to, it has to cut both ways. It's important to note that the last time you and I talked, that uh, well over 80% of the transactions in the uranium business were taking place in the spot market. So the prices were set overnight. Uh, recently, as much as 75% of the transactions have taken place in the term market. So the market is very, very different today than it was when you and I talked before. We have seen the specialist resource investors, the industrial materials investors, and some utilities investors come into the bigger names. But the story really has been driven by ETF buyers, uh, retail buyers. And they've been, it's been driven uh, potentially, uh, pardon me, uh, prominently by North American high net worth retail and small institutional. And as we understand it, uh, some Japanese and Chinese institutional or parastatal buyers. That's anecdotal. Uh, and, and I think that from the point of view of investors who are concerned about carbon loading, while at the same time concerned about global energy poverty, uh, uranium has been given a pass on some of its best, best vaccines because it's the only source of economic baseload power in the world that doesn't generate carbon. In this next segment, Rick Rule highlights the persistent challenges faced by alternative energy sources like wind and solar power in significantly reducing carbon emissions and addressing global energy poverty. Despite a $5 trillion investment in renewables over 40 years, fossil fuels market share has only decreased by 1%. Rule asserts that uranium remains the most viable solution for reducing carbon emissions and uplifting a billion people from energy poverty. He observes a shift in perception where even prominent figures who previously dismissed uranium as an option are now recognizing its necessity. This changing narrative includes unexpected supporters, such as the co-founder of Greenpeace, embracing nuclear energy as a politically correct choice in the fight against climate change. Here is the clip. People had to walk through all of the available alternatives uh, in their mind before they could allow themselves to get back to uranium. People said to me as an objection three years ago, what about wind and solar? What about renewables? We have now invested as a species over 40 years five trillion dollars, trillion dollars in alternative energies. And we've reduced the market share of fossil fuels from a high of 82% 40 years ago, all the way down to 81 today. A five trillion dollar investment has reduced the market share of fossil fuels by 1%. If we're going to reduce carbon emissions, if we are, and we're going to lift a billion people in the world uh, out of energy poverty, the only choice we have is uranium. While people have resisted that reality, they've come to understand that it is reality nonetheless. People who five years ago would have parenthetically thought uranium was a four-letter word, I'm talking about my president, your prime minister, as an example, uh, now are both cautious. The big thinkers, as I call them, uh, have come to the uranium narrative uh, in fits and starts but they've been totally ambushed by reality. It is contrary to their narrative. You know, it's ironic that uh, the big thinkers of the world fly a thousand private jets to Davos to ask you to drive less. Yes. Uh, but part of the outcome of that is even the co-founder of Greenpeace is pro-nuclear. Uh, it, it's odd from my point of view after 70 years on the planet to be viewed as politically correct. Thank you for tuning in to today's insightful discussion on the uranium market with Rick Rule. We've covered some crucial points that shed light on the current dynamics of the industry. In summary, larger companies like Cameco and BHP Billiton are expected to outperform due to their ability to bring existing mines back into production, taking advantage of stable, long-term contracts in the term market. Despite significant investments in renewable energy sources, uranium remains the most viable solution for reducing carbon emissions and uplifting a billion people from energy poverty. This reality has even surprised prominent figures who were once skeptical about nuclear energy. As the world grapples with the challenges of climate change and energy poverty, uranium stands out as a key player in shaping our future. Stay informed, stay engaged, and stay tuned for more updates on the ever-changing world of finance and energy.